Hey, everybody. Happy Sunday. Happy Memorial Day weekend. If you were in the US, thank you all for being here. Let's go. This is the time of the week where we answer all your top questions, all the things that are burning in your mind, and there's a lot going on. So just uh, Mike is working. Everything's working. Let's go. A lot of <laughs> 40 slides to get through. Make it fast. Now nah, I did that again. One second. Boom. Yes. Wrong slide. Okay. Uh, disclaimer, of course, as well. This is edutainment and it's not financial advice. Uh, first of all, first question is from Kemu. When you talk about Bitcoin or stocks bottoming, are you talking bear cycle bottom or swing bottom? So um, there's many, many different ways of de determining exactly what cycle bottoms are, swing bottoms, but I like to think about bottoms in general. And remember, a lot of people sometimes forget this, bear market can cause severe emotional distress on people. But remember, markets spend 90 to 95% of the time going up. That's just the nature of the beast. So uh, it's a good time, though, for the bears to be very bearish. Let's first of all say, I cannot break the future, but we do have some history. We also know this time is different. Every <laughs> That's the old joke that uh, Rob was mentioning the other day. But maybe if you are talking about Bitcoin cycles, yes, there's a lot different this cycle. Now, market structure is also different. Cycles are different, but we have this macro hangover. And we got war, fear of interest rate hikes, fear of recession, fear of quantitative tightening, fear, fear, fear all across the board. And that's putting a big lid on the upwards price action. It's like a perfect storm hitting us at the same time. But let's talk about stock market bottom. First of all, the market typically, and I spelled all this out in detail so you guys know that because the question was kind of loaded. The market tests areas of support to find price levels where selling is exhausted and buyers step in. Remember, markets are self-equalizing mechanisms. We saw this a week ago with equities. We also made a double bottom in the S&P 500. I'll talk about that in a minute too. We saw smart money stepping in. That's good. And we saw some earnings beat, which is good too. And we saw the Fed telegraph two more hikes only. That was huge. Like I, well, I was so surprised the market didn't explode when they said that. But again, they're telegraphing everything. They want to try and engineer a soft landing. And that's very, very important for us here in the market. So let's look at the chart for a second. This is the S&P 500 over the last two years. And you see a couple of things that are very simple. I drew in some green lines to indicate the channel. You can see we are out of the Bollinger Band March 2020. That was the C19 situation. And of course, we had a double bottom just over the last 10 days to two weeks. And remember, we are under the 200 day moving average. That's the blue line on the chart. And the market typically, stock market has to go up 15% per year because of fiat debasement. So think about all those different factors. That's what I look at. Not sling and hopium, but uh, bear markets bring us about opportunities. Now let's switch gears and talk about the Bitcoin bottom. Clearly, it seems to me that equities did bottom, especially with some of the rallies we had off the lows. Many stocks are up 25% off the lows just in a couple of days. But here, the Bitcoin bottom, and a big thank you as well to some of the inspiration for this is from Dan Moorhead. Um, Bitcoin has been operating for nearly 13 years, but really effectively as a tradable asset for a decade. We've had six big cycles. Remember as well, the weighted average bear market loss during these six big cycles is 61%. Look at all these sixes, it's kind of crazy. And we hit 62% off the all-time high. So it's pretty much bang on. That means we are technically close to a bottom. Now, the bear market's been going on for about 110 days approximately, which is the average for a bear market. And the first bear market in Bitcoin history in which it has given back more than 100% of the previous bull market. That is unusual. This is why I say, yes, these cycles are different. And this is also different. It's the first time we've had a new low after a bear market. Think about that. Now, remember, the conclusion here is we are closer to the beginning than the end. That means we have maximum 100 days more, which is in line with my thesis that the final Fed hike or the final indication will come sometime August, maybe September. And then it'll be rocket boosters on and whoosh, market. But remember, the markets front run everything. Everything front runs everything. For example, we're in a recession right now. It hasn't been posted yet. By the time they say we're actually in a recession, we'll be out of it on the other side. So j just think about that as well. Now, is it an excellent time to buy Bitcoin? 
Well, yes, we have analyzed. Over the last five years, there have been 26 great opportunities to buy Bitcoin, and three of them happened in the last few weeks. So it's just numbers. Um, technically, are we at a bottom? No, but are we very close to it? Yes. Are we clo we're more close to the end of the bear market than the beginning? Yes. So just hang tight, everybody. Good time to stack. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Speaking of stacking, this is from Dimcho. Could you recommend a better strategy than DCA in S&P 500 for people lacking the time to swing trade or bottom fish? So this actually is a great question. Um, I tried to bang out all the numbers this morning, but ran out of time. But what I can tell you is we're doing a DCA on, on steroids strategy for Bitcoin next week. Uh, it's taken a little longer than normal to uh, calculate the end result. But if we look at the S&P um, 500 in the same framework we look at here, it's a couple of things. One, the blue is the S&P performance since January 2020. And you can see where the big orange dip is. It kind of corresponds to the blue line, which is the market price. And you can see we're still up. Again, like I say, the markets will go up 10 to 15% every single year because fiat is going down by at least that. Now, we have not run the model on dca into S&P 500, but what you can do, a simple little method, is look at this here. I calculated the average distance from all-time high of the S&P 500 over the last two years, and that is exactly 4.83% is the average delta from the all-time high. So this is the best time to double or triple down. Simply wait, wait for this moment, wait till, you know, right now, of course, you know, the S&P 500 is what, 14, 15% for the all-time high. But if you can time it, and when next time we get to a new all-time high, now is the time, of course, to layer in as much as you can, as much as you can afford, as much as you can invest. But typically, when we get back to an all-time high, that's when you pull the brakes on and you stop and you wait to dip off again to that 4%, 4.83%. And that is kind of method. But we're going to analyze much more history, much more data, and get a better answer for you. But typically, that's how we like. Like, for example, with me, I don't buy Bitcoin over 42K, but I layer in harder every certain amount of drops. And I consider it my money market account. So, great question. Next question uh, from Magellan3100. Can you provide direction on building a set it and forget it portfolio to gradually accumulate wealth? Well, I can't tell you what to do, but I can show you what I do and how I view kind of the world going forward. First of all, my strategy is always heavy allocations into three categories. It's real estate, equities, and crypto, equal bags of each. Imagine you have $1 million in each or whatever, 100,000 in each, $300,000 portfolio. Now, things will go out of skew. If real estate skyrockets, it might outperform crypto, etc. In certain markets, it's good to have real estate. It makes you feel very comfortable, like now. And also, I do believe that 98 to 99% of the following items will be around in 10 years. That is Bitcoin and Tesla and maybe Google. They are my big set it and forget it. You know, Google has a 20 for one stock split coming up in July. Tesla probably have a five for one stock split coming up in August. And Bitcoin is Bitcoin. The adoption is going bonkers all over the world every time we look around. So Set it and forget it is always dangerous. I always say keep your tap dancing shoes on. But um, what I what I'm doing, and I'm like eighty three percent, eighty five percent in in my equities is Tesla, and eighty three percent or so is Bitcoin, and the rest, uh, the other two, which will remain nameless, but you guys know what they are. And in the big lion's share of my uh, equity portfolio, apart from Tesla is a big chunk of Google, but 10% Google, and the rest is kind of microstrategy, Amazon, stuff like that. So that's what I do. They are my big bets. And by the way, uh, last time I shared this portfolio, somebody made a comment that that's very irresponsible, very risky. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm not recommending anybody do it. It's what I do because I can't find better, safer risk reward assets out there right now. And if one blows up, imagine Tesla blows up, I still have Bitcoin. Imagine Bitcoin blows up, I still have Tesla. The odds of both them blowing up is next to zero. So, fingers crossed. I <laughs> hope I don't speak too soon. Touch wood. All right, next question from Eternal Patience. At this stage, how much does your conviction in Tesla rely on Elon's continued involvement? 
Very good question. It's like everybody's, everybody's thinking about all the same type of things and all these questions are bleeding into one another, which is great. So first of all, this is per Elon Musk in a tweet. And I do believe the success of Tesla is 90% tied to Elon. But even without him, it would still go forward, but it probably wouldn't be pushed forward as hard. Let's put it that way. Now, he replied to somebody's tweet, Ava Fox, the long-term potential of Tesla is high. And this triggered a response from uh, Stephen Mark Ryan, who is a great uh, Tesla podcaster. And uh, before I talk about this piece, there is also, before I forget, the danger of assassination. There was some news report today that uh, the Chinese are looking to take Starlink satellites out of orbit. They see them as a threat. I know the Russians aren't too happy with Elon Musk either. So he's making enemies. The Demo Democratic Party in the US is not too happy with him. So maybe time Elon <laughs> step back and just focus on your stuff. But anyway, what he also <laughs> also said was uh, he privately modeled Tesla out into the distant future. No point in sharing as these estimates due to extreme level of uncertainty, et cetera, et cetera. But the importance of EV, I guess he means fleet size plus bot fleet size can't be overstated. The further into the future, the larger the fleets, the more insane the numbers. Basically, Tesla is four or five or six or seven S curves all colliding together at the same time. It is mind boggling the potential that this company has. So I'm just excited. I'm uh, going to make it my focus to try and be alive for the next 10 years to watch this all play out. Next question from Turbo Scott. Uh, what risks do you see in Solana as a five plus year investment? Thinking of doubling my shares to lower my average price, but that takes my sol back to over 20%. Too risky? Yes, it is too risky. Uh, one thing we've learned over the last couple of weeks is crypto is risky. I've always called it the Wild West, but boy, everything is amping up. Regulation is coming. We don't know how that's going to play out. We, there are 98% of cryptos are very, very dangerous. They're Ponzi-based schemes that line inside our pockets, etc. So be very careful. Uh, currently, I'm under just under 5% Solana right now. So 20% is far too high for anything other than Bitcoin at the moment. And But I do believe, and I'll get some hate for this, but the risk-adjusted and upside-weighted return per our models, uh, Solana and Ethereum are still the safest bets. But remember, things can change awfully fast. One of the dramatic things we discovered was the amount of daily active users disappearing from chains, literally in the space of two or three months. The amount of TVL disappearing from chains in literally two or three months was staggering. I've never seen anything like it. Of course, all heavily, a lot of the action you see on chains is driven by incentives. And those incentives typically are not sustainable. Therefore, be very careful. Be in stable, stable chains, but always have your tap dancing shoes on because you never know what could happen. So we, one of the wings could come off Ethereum and just be ready to get out. That's why I don't stake Ethereum. Uh, something could happen, a, a chronic failure or outage could happen to another chain. Who knows? Just uh, be very careful out there. Always be ready to move and don't wait. The first sign of smoke, boom, bounce. That's the safest way. But remember, <laughs> this is probably the most important thing. Typically in the world, when there are things like blockchains, layer ones, there will be two that dominate. One will have 70% market share, the other one will have 30% market share. The rest will wither away. So watch for that. And we spend a lot of time trying to identify who those two winners are. And that's all I can say. But it's, um, again, we just look at numbers. Next question is, what are your top three option strategies that you like to use in a bear market from Roth Bardian? Cool name. So a uh, couple of things. Remember, bear market is typically a time for great accumulation and you do not want to be called out of a pristine asset like Tesla. So I, I only really sell call options on Tesla, like cover call strategy when it's close to a top or it's completely overbought based on our models. Now, one of the things as well in these bear markets, the high level of fear and high volatility make puts very, very, very juicy to sell. So I like bear put spreads. For those who do not know, a bear put spread is you... Uh, purchase put options of a higher strike, which is typically in the money, and you sell the put option of the same equity or crypto out of the money for a lower strike price, which is out of the money. And you get a net debit for this, but this is the way you can kind of build 
kind of like a collar around your position and do that. So that's first. Second is selling naked calls. Um, risky, especially if you're doing it on a meme stock that explodes because of Wall Street bets. And the third thing is put selling at the bottom. But remember, sometimes put selling, if you are at a bottom, it can be juicy premium, but you miss the upside. So I do like for things that I believe are going to go bombastic and exponential, I like to be on a call in the money call, preferably out at least to January 2014. So I hope that helps. Now, another options question from Last Chance Saloon. Would you recommend the wheel strategy with regard to trading options? And what do you like, dislike about it? So I've tried everything in the options world. And, uh, you know, if, if normally, unless it's uh, unforeseen circumstances, the one that I use works very, very effectively. But the wheel strategy, let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, for those who don't know, it's typically a strategy where you sell a put on a stock you want to own. Put selling can be very lucrative, especially in a choppy market with volatility. And what you do is you get paid a premium from the buyer. For example, if the stock is above your strike price, then the option is worthless. So you profit the premium. And then the strategy calls for you to continue to sell puts in the stock until the price goes below your strike price. And by doing this, you essentially are buying the stock at the strike price. And if the stock price is below your strike price, then you sell the covered call against the shares you bought. And then you rinse and repeat, et cetera, and on and on. And this uh, works well for certain type of high volatility equities. For crypto, it's not so great because you can miss out on some opportunities with very, very volatile assets. There is a more sophisticated version of this as well that involves here in the middle, same type of thing. You sell a put, stock goes down, stock goes up. But if the stock goes down and you get assigned the actual stock, then you can sell a straddle. And that is a simultaneous purchase of options to buy and sell a security or a commodity at a fixed price. So that's another for the more advanced users, another way you can do it too. But note, very important here, wheel strategy works best on stocks with higher implied volatility and the higher implied volatility provides better premiums. But remember, you don't want to do this type of thing and hope for the best if we are in a situation, for example, when Tesla was at 200, did a 5-1 stock split and then went to 1,000 and then went back to, or just, I can't remember what it did, but when, if, if you had done this strategy on those types of names, you miss out all the upside, which is the big concern. So that's why I don't do it too much. Um, in fact, I tried it a few times back in the 2000s in the bear market post.com bust, but I prefer just doing cover calls and swinging as well. So next question is from Jason C. Thoughts about DeFi projects that use reward coins to create value for their platforms. Interesting one. And again, remember, crypto is the Wild West. So always ask, does this token need to exist? Everybody needs to be really critical and ask that important question. Remember, is it critical to a DeFi project that offers governance tokens? Tokens are not stocks. They do not represent shares of a company or a project. Hence, a governance token only has a fundamental value if it is the central part of the project's value proposition. And if that is not the case, then it's really questionable why they have it. Now, there are some that are good. For example, Maker. Uh, this is a good example of a project that has a very well-designed governance token. And you've got firms like A16Z are very big on DAOs, etc. But the after you have to look at the core purpose here. And it has to be integral to the economic value of the project of the system. For example, MakerDAO's governance token is, is the best out there that we know of. Um, and the goal is to maintain DAI's peg to the US dollar. We learned all about the importance of maintaining a peg recently. And this is an incredibly complex problem that requires dynamic decision making. And this is how this one actually works effectively. But there are other examples. For example, Uniswap. You guys all know Uniswap. This is an example of questionable governments. So why is there a Uniswap governance token issued? They operated fine for years without one. And uh, Uniswap essentially operated as an automated service provider on the Ethereum blockchain, letting uh, customers swap tokens, ERC, ERC20 tokens. And there was no need for tweaking or adjusting parameters like Maker. However, as time went on, Uniswap faced competition. And these companies like SushiSwap, SundaySwap, etc. issued tokens 
to reward liquidity providers for providing the liquidity to the chains, et cetera, et cetera. And the founders and community saw this as a threat and issued a governance token. So again, incentives, like I mentioned at the beginning, and this is why the fundamental uni governance token is extremely questionable. And there's also, for those who have time, um, this is a, a funny kind of the Fugazi governance, 99.9% .9 of tokens. It is a meme parody of the movie Wolf of Wall Street on YouTube that illustrates this concept. Well, I'll drop a link for this video in the bottom, but basically all it says is, hey, we got to issue governance tokens because it helps with liquidity. And again, analyze the purpose of why these things are happening. So from our perspective, no, <laughs> do, do not touch them. Next question is from the Oracle. Where does the Fed, BlackRock, and other hedge funds, private equity, park their money after the last two sell-offs in stocks and crypto? Good question. So if you look at, say, Fed and BlackRock here, uh, <laughs> they don't need to park their money anywhere. They own the money printer, so they can just print money. Uh, <laughs> that's the Fed. Now, BlackRock and other investment banks park the money in real estate. They're buying up farmland, stocks, Bitcoin. Um, however, right now, these institutional investors are doubling down on Bitcoin. We're seeing a lot of that. Fidelity, BlackRock, Charles Schwab, Credit Suisse, they're all working on a Bitcoin ETF and building out their own crypto divisions. And JP Morgan even recently came out of their analysis that shows that Bitcoin is way undervalued. I think they came out with a fair value of 38K. So it's funny because Jamie Dimon doesn't like Bitcoin, but the team that are in the company kind of do. So uh, this is really kind of what actually happens here. So also you got to bear in mind that hedge funds, etc., they're not allowed to sit in cash because they know it debases better than anybody else. They have to put money to work. And that's why I am a big believer that dips happen, but they're bought up fast, real fast. And just look at the S&P 500 chart I showed before. It's like the V-shaped recovery of C19. And then the one we're in right now, who knows where it'll go, but things do not stay down for long. Again, overall trajectory is up. And what do I know? I've only been looking at charts go up for 30 years. Anywho, next question uh, from TS Architecture. If Bitcoin price falls below profitable mining levels and the majority of miners shut off their rigs, is Bitcoin network vulnerable to a 51% attack or can the price go to zero? Brilliant question. There are many beautiful things about Bitcoin, but this is probably one of the most. Uh, first of all, when Bitcoin price drops, it's the least efficient miners that will drop off first. Those that can't get, have cheap, cheap electricity or have old, old rigs, etc. And as they drop off, the hash rate drops. However, and we just had a hash rate adjustment downwards actually recently over the last couple of days. However, every two weeks or so, the algorithm will detect the dip and adjust the difficulty down. This is just almost magical all automatically. And then when the hash rate goes down, it makes miners profitable again. And then these miners come back in. And remember, keep in mind that the hash power also has an impact on price. These two variables are interconnected. And this means that as the hash power returns, so will price. The reason being, the more hash power, the more secure the network becomes, therefore the more valuable Bitcoin fundamentally. And an easy way to visualize this is basically economic... <laughs> excuse me, uh, supply and demand. If the hash power drops too much too fast before difficulty can adjust, then market dynamics will kick in. For example, a sudden dip in hash power will lead to an undersupply of miners to meet the demand of confirming transactions. And that will drive up the fees, remember that, which leads to increased miner profitability and again, bringing miners back into the fold. Hence the incentive structure of Bitcoin always seeks to find equilibrium where the block times are around 10 minutes with a new block reward that's have roughly every four years. We all know the history here. So as long as this reward subsidy exists, the security of the system can be maintained. And that is the beauty of Bitcoin. And nobody can control it. So a big thank you everybody to your super chats and contributions. We adopted a papaya troop. This is a group of 10 orphaned baby howler monkeys in Costa Rica that require 24 hour care and uh, they formed a bond and they're all getting on very well. So thank you all for making that happen. And we hope to go down to Costa Rica soon and visit them all. So big thanks to everybody again. And now I'll take some of your live questions. Boom, turn that stuff off. Give me one second. And a big thank you to the mods as well. Hey Caligula, good to see you in the chat. 
and everybody else. Um, Bombiki, <laughs> love for the hours. You're incredible. I hope your travels are going well and you're getting some rest. Appreciate you, sir. Thank you. Always very generous. Trust no one. Uh, why don't you measure the value of the SCP tokens by free cash flow? The monetary premium on them is pure speculation. I feel they are fundamentally overvalued. Ethereum down. Thoughts? Let me see. So one of the things we are trying to do, I don't know if this addresses the question. I do believe on a money transfer basis, Ethereum is extremely undervalued. If you use traditional banking valuation metrics, um, it is very undervalued. That's why I'm very bullish on Ethereum because it's everywhere and they've got 3,000 dApps that do so much. So that is definitely powerful. One of the things we try to do is analyze. Uh, the dream is we have daily active users, but if we could calculate the daily active users in combination with daily transactions and the average value of each transaction, that's what we're trying to do. But getting this data is so hard. As we learned last week, even getting daily active users, accurate information from all the subscriptions that we buy, some of the data is flawed. So you, you can't rely on, you know, phantom data from into the block or whatever else. You got to double check, triple check. And getting that level of detail around transaction value would be huge. But uh, the only place I can get it is Ethereum. And I would like to get it in some others. We are working on it, but I think that would actually be a huge uh, way of actually valuing the smart contract platforms. So brilliant question. Trust no one. Trust me. We're working on it. <laughs> and as soon as we have it, you'll see it. Alex, uh, why do you think Sol's bottom is in this bear market cycle? Or what do you think Sol's bottom is in this bear market cycle? And do you think it'll be 90% off the all-time high, which you're bringing to the mid-20s? So this is uh, a question that is sometimes uh, Solana has been a very weird mistress. I first bought it at 8 bucks, then at $20, and again at $22. Uh, you've seen videos about that uh, back in March, and April, and then June. 22nd, I think it was. Uh, so we were buying back there. And that's just 10, 11, 11 months ago. So we're still two and a half times kind of the early level. And comparing it to other cryptos, it's actually holding up well. What annoys people is it shot to 250, went from eight bucks to 250, and then fell down again. So now we're at a fifth of where we are. But I just want to, I just want to share this example. And this is just history. I'm not saying where things are going to go or whatever else. And yeah, we could go back to 20. I've committed that if that does happen and the fundamentals have not changed and the adoption is still going upwards, I will back up the truck and I'll swap everything into it. Um, so that's kind of the plan. But right now, you know, we, we, we watched this very carefully over the weekend, the Bitcoin dominance. It looks like it topped out on Friday. It fell off a little bit. I don't know where it's going to go. It all depends on money flows and lack of security, but I'm seeing a lot of smart contract platforms actually go up. I'm seeing all the Ponzi coins tank hard, and that's actually helping Bitcoin dominance too. The question is, where is the money going? So we will have to see. In terms of bottom, it could be 20. It looks like 40, 36, 38, $40 is very solid support. But getting back to my historical example, I was buying up um, my ETH average price about 200 bucks. Uh, did a lot of buying in early 2020. Uh, at the same time, Bitcoin bounced from 4K straight up to 9K. It hovered between 8.5 and 11,000 for a few months. So my average at that time was 9. Now, if you calculate where ETH went versus Bitcoin, 200 to what we are, say, 2,000, you know, that's a, a 10X, call it a 9X if people want to be really accurate based on the exact prices today. Ethereum did 9X. Bitcoin is not a 3x. This is why you need to layer into these riskier assets, but they have way more alpha. Again, the 800 pound gorilla doesn't move that much. Will it go up two and a half, three 3x? Yes. We don't know when. Uh, will ETH double, triple, quintuple? Probably. But what will these others do? That's the interesting thing, and that's why I play this game. And that's why even if you have a small allocation in your portfolio, my Solana is of uh, my cryptos is less than 5% right now because it shrank. <laughs> but if it goes back to all-time highs, it will become an inordinate position that I'll probably have to layer out of too. As per the question earlier, is 20% too much? And until we see a more stable version of Solana, 
Yeah, it definitely is. So bottom answer to your question, short answer. 36, if there's another capitulation moment in crypto, I don't know. One other thing as well, sorry for rambling here, but these are really hard questions that have so many dimensions. We saw a decoupling with the equity markets for the last couple of days. That hasn't happened in a long time. Markets have gone risk on, but crypto hasn't followed yet. Watch that space carefully. Next week could be interesting. Nick Flatbush. Oh, and of course, the kick in the teeth that crypto got because of Luna. That has a big impact too. Nick Flatbush, a Texas AG. I think that's Attorney General Ken Paxton is suing Biden administrative order, executive order to raise Fed contractors to minimum $15, claiming to raise inflation. Agree, 2017 tax cuts on top of the companies paid 0% tax inflation. Let me try to digest this. I haven't been following this news. Um, executive order to raise Fed, claiming to raise inflation. That there could be, obviously, I think the big angle here is wage inflation is coming. It really lags the economy and prices, but people are hurting right now. Everything is 20% more expensive than a year ago, pretty much all across the board. So people do need to be paid more or else they're shrinking. Uh, I saw a report recently that people aren't able to DCA to Bitcoin anymore because everything has gotten so expensive, the gasoline and payments and rent and all these other things, which is just awful. So I agree. Uh, yes. Uh, well, it's it's weird. People need to be paid more. So this guy suing the executive order to raise federal contractors is driving inflation. It's It's one of those weird political tricky situations, I'd tend to be on the side that, uh, you know, if, if you in the US are earning minimum wage, which I know it's 10, 12, $15, whatever it is right now, and you live in a normal average or above place, you can't live on one job. Uh, and if you got to raise a family and feed kids, it's just shocking. So my take is wage inflation is coming. Um, but People need to be paid more because everything's so much more expensive. C, looking at the 100-year chart, two lost decades due to war, disease, are we in one? Also, is the U.S. going to make a digital dollar? Uh, this is a tough one because I read a lot about Ukraine, Russia, China. I think Russia tested their supersonic uh, missile, hypersonic missile um, yesterday or today, and they're very proud of that could that could really rattle some some sabers out there, which could accelerate the situation. And then um, there's a lot a lot of tension in the world. It's a big tinderbox that could explode at any time. I hope not. I'm hoping smarter minds will prevail and we'll have peace real soon. Uh, second question regarding the digital dollar. Are we going to have one? Yes. Everything has to be digital. We're in a digital age. The fact that it doesn't exist today, technically it does actually. Most dollars are actually not even printed. They're just little buttons, little pieces of code. But, uh, you know, when you see the stuff going on in Europe right now and the master plans of European governments to have a digital euro and then the CBDC in China, I mean, it is just so Orwellian, it is terrifying. And that's why I'm also extremely bullish on Bitcoin because these types of digital dollars, Fed dollars, etc., will bring about a tremendous demand for Bitcoin. Now, on the Fed dollar sign, there's a lot of positive signs from politicians that they will do something like a stable coin and not a central bank digital currency that is highly manipulative and controllable. So fingers crossed, uh, voters will enforce them to have a more fair system, not an Orwellian system. Matt C, can you explain why the Fed's hands are tied with regards to rate hikes and debt servicing? Thank you for everything. Yeah, it's real simple. And they telegraphed them and talked about it for a long time. So I built a model that actually calculates the impact of every 25 basis point you hike interest rates based on the amount of US debt, the effective interest rate that they have to pay on that debt, and the amount that this sucks out of the economic system, which basically brings down GDP. So because the debt to GDP ratio is about 129%, every time they jack rates, they crush GDP growth more. That's why they're stuck. If they do more than 200 additional basis points from where they are now, they basically throw the system into financial Armageddon. It's that simple. <laughs> they, they, if you jack uh, rates beyond, yeah, say, 200 basis points more, take it up to an effective interest rate that the Fed pays of 
that debt servicing will reduce GDP growth, which is already frail, down around negative, it'll take it down more than 3%, 4%, 5%. And that's the problem. That's why I say they're boxed in. And uh, I can do a video on that model if you guys, if you guys are interested. Drop a comment below. But <laughs> it's only for macro geeks. Otherwise, everybody would be really bored. Uh, Bob, what's the best place to store wallet keys? Paper and digital documents are all prone to get lost and misplaced and burned up and fires hacked. So I believe in having two places. You could have a, a safe in your house for half or whatever you need, half of your seed phrase or wallets, and then a safe deposit box at a bank is a very, it's well worth the money, especially if you have, if you've got substantial amounts in crypto, like more than a quarter of a million, um, a safe deposit box, uh, and then detailed instructions, all the stuff we've covered uh, for your loved ones, if anything ever happens. Remember, um, who knows? I know people, you know, people have skiing accidents and motorbike accidents and stuff. So be careful out there, everybody. Our goal is to get through the next 10 to 15 years so we can see the fruits of our efforts. Uh, Fibonacci, could you share your thoughts on collaborative custody, multi-sig options like CASA or Unchained Capital? I've heard a lot of good things about Unchained Capital. I don't use it myself. And CASA, I don't know. But if you guys are interested in this, we can do, we've got a whole uh, detailed series on wallets and security. Uh, check those out. We do talk about a whole bunch of multi-sig options. We also have a new clips channel. We'll break out all of the clips around security. We'll create a separate clips playlist so you don't have to watch a 30-minute <laughs> video on security, but just get the nugget you want around multi-sig. Um, but I've never done a formal review of a review of Casa or Unchain Capital. Um, but definitely, if you have three parties, uh, it's definitely the way to go with substantial dollar amounts. So great question, Fibonacci. And Gabe Ferreira, perspective on FS, FX quant trading and high frequency algor algorithmic trading. For example, the Medallion Fund. Um, and you have a chance to look into Freeway. I did look into Freeway. It's a fascinating project. Um, I haven't had a chance to value it yet. So thank you for that. And regarding um, quant trading, high frequency trading, the markets are completely driven by that right now. I know that... I watch everything that Sam Bankman Fried does. It is staggering. He's like the Elon Musk of trading and exchanges and finance. The pace at which he's moving, the pace at which he's developing and launching products, and even buying sports centers is staggering. So uh, it, it is concerning. I, I do believe w one of the things I'm concerned about for the future is how do we as individual investors beat the algos, beat the bots when it comes to trading. And the simple way is really just play, you know, mean reversion, play the trends, you know, buy more when things are cheaper, hedge your risk while you can, but don't try uh, and beat the high frequency players. Although we have been testing something over the last couple of weeks um, on one minute charts and five minute charts, which has actually proven to be uh, quite effective. So Stay tuned for that. Um, I will, I'm trying to, I did look at Freeway and I was very impressed. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Um, I'm going to see if I can put together a very quick video on its, what I believe the fundamental value of it is as well, but it's really good. And Caligula, big shout out to IA community. Love you guys. Love you too, man. Hope you're feeling better. Hope you're 100% recovered. And a big thank you to as well for the donation as well. Jeff Hammer, Dog One, Mrs. Reed, Breakbeat Stew, AC1, and Marina Gada Borshev. Hope I got that right. Wesley Snipes, buddy, how are you? Huckleberry, Native, uh, Future Millionaire, Cropcraft, Robert Steffek, and Duncan Heather. Really appreciate you all and all the goodness we can do for the animals. And on that note, since I started, Bitcoin went up a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, hang on a second. I thought I started, I thought it went up 150 bucks. Uh, maybe I just can't see it. Anyway, happy Sunday, everybody. I'll see you all tomorrow. And happy Memorial Day weekend for those in the U.S. Bye.